budgets, I mean, none of us can say that we ever have had, you know, the most money we've ever needed or wanted. However, when you bring coalitions together, a lot of times people can bring resources to the table. And even if it's a group of, you know, small nonprofits, for instance, and they only, this person only, this organization might only have $200 to put towards a program or an event. If every member has $200, Pretty soon you're going to have a pretty large budget to do something with. So having more members allows you to access more resources and not just money, but other resources as well. You know, buildings, um, equipment, in-kind stuff, um, you know, transportation vehicles, whatever it might be. Coalitions also increase the reputation of its members and usually that's good. Occasionally it might be bad. But um, the credibility of the coalition's efforts also increase when you have a lot of organizations involved who are known in your community and well respected. Um, it does increase the credibility of the coalition and the reputation of the coalition. And then coalitions, like I said earlier, allow for more diverse range of people and organizations. This increases your reach, your influence, you know, your area of expertise, your credibility. Um, and your coalition efforts. Anybody have any comments or questions about what you've seen so far? Okay. So we're going to talk about challenges of a coalition. Um, if any of you have ever been in a coalition and have never had any challenges in that coalition, I would love to speak to you because. I want to know what your secret is. I think all of us have probably found ourselves in a situation where one or more of these exist. Um, in almost every coalition, there will be strong personalities. And that person might be you. You might have the strong personality. And that isn't a bad thing. But there does have to be a process in place to allow strong personalities to have input, but also to not allow them to derail you know, discussions or progress. Um, power struggles. I think we all have probably dealt with a coalition where there's been power struggle between, you know, maybe small and large organizations or someone who's been in prevention for 30 years versus someone who's just coming into the field. One strong organization or person can take over the entire process of a coalition and sometimes derail its progress because all you're doing is, you know, trying to mediate power struggles and that of course does not help you have a unified message or a unified purpose sometimes there are compromising positions within a coalition um, maybe you don't agree with someone on a policy or maybe you want to do an evidence-based program and someone wants to do a mock car crash which we know is not evidence-based so how do you handle those compromising positions? And sometimes it means that you're gonna to have to give up something that you want. Um, I've experienced this many times at the State House. There'll be an alcohol bill that has, you know, 40 pages of things I don't like and one page of things that I do like and want. And I've had to really learn how to accept the bad to get some good. And it's not easy. It's not easy for me because I don't like to do that. But in a coalition situation, you have to be prepared to do that. Unfortunately, if one coalition member, you know, does something that's detrimental to the coalition um, or goes rogue, as I like to say, the reputation of all the members and the expertise of, you know, your coalition can be harmed. And your, um, it's really hard to gain that trust back. Um, I've seen it happen before, and fortunately, you know, after some time, the coalition was able to rebuild after, you know, their chairperson kind of went off on their own and, you know, was doing things that the coalition didn't agree with. But it, it doesn't always happen, and it takes a lot of time, and it, you know how hard it is to rebuild trust with people once it is um, taken away. So when one falls, we all fall down. Um, sometimes 
it takes forever and ever to do something in a coalition because coalitions often have committees and committees take a long time to go through things. You know, sometimes you want something decided on or something done right away and it just doesn't happen because the process is cumbersome and decision, decision making takes longer when you're working in a coalition, but it is part of the process and it's important to go through that. Now, obviously, if you have time limits on things, you kind of have to monitor that to make sure things are getting accomplished, but it can take longer in a coalition. And then you always have people who want credit for things when they've worked in a coalition and you know you may not get the credit um you may not you know be the one that is singled out for doing this great accomplishment that it might have been all you you know maybe your coalition passes a a local ordinance or a bill at the state house and it was all because of your work but the coalition gets the credit, not you. And that's tough. And sometimes we can take that personally. But I've learned that, um, you know what? I don't care who gets the credit as long as the work gets done. I feel good because I know I've had a part of it and um, that's enough for me. But that's hard, to, uh, that's hard to come to sometimes for us because we like kudos and pats on the back and there's nothing wrong with that. Would anyone like to uh, share an experience that you've had um in a coalition either forming one or being in one where you have come across strong personalities power struggles um any of these things and how did you handle it just unmute your microphones and you can speak Anybody want to share anything? Hi, Lisa. This is Eric. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Eric. Hi. I was just going to say, I, I don't know. Power struggle is a strong term. But yeah, you know, we, <laughs> we were getting our coalition started and we did an exercise where we sort of go around and talk about all the projects and topics and things that we hope to address. And it just goes down some real rabbit holes. I mean, people want to talk yeah. about the food in a vending machine. They want to talk about why isn't this one website updated more often? And I'm like, you know, like that sounds like something that, you know, you could talk to that webmaster about. It, not everything has to be a coalition thing, but um, it, it, just the differences in pet projects, I think is, is sort of part of that power struggle. And if somebody who's bringing their pet to the coalition, hoping that it's going to be the thing that gets taken up, uh, it might need to, you know, wait in line if it's not a huge priority for everybody else. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, you know, what is important to me, maybe I really am concerned that the vending machine just has, you know, all kinds of junk in it, and I wanted to have, you know, this healthy food. And to me, that's my most important issue. But to the larger coalition, that probably won't isn't the most important issue. And you have, you know, a long-term vision that doesn't necessarily include what's in the vending machine so that's a good point it may not always look like a power struggle but people come to the table with agendas and we know that and um we come to take come to the table with our own agendas so we have to think about you know what what we're doing as well um to you know to facilitate are we pushing our own agendas to the detriment of others Okay, I'm going to do one of the polls now. So you should be able to answer. Um, well, you know what? I think I'll do it in a minute because um, I want to talk about one more slide. Um, and then most of us in prevention have probably, you know, this is what our coalition goals might look like. We want to influence policy and legislation, perhaps change practices, you know, build networks, educate people, um, educate our community, and strengthen people's knowledge and skills. That's basically, that's the spectrum of prevention. Um, and most of us probably focus on at least one of these in our task forces or our coalitions. And if we don't, then we may need to figure out what is our purpose. So, 
who should be involved in your coalition? So this is where you probably expect me to give you a list of people who should be involved in your organization coalition, your community coalition, your campus task force, your campus coalition. And there are plenty of resources out there that tell you have these people at the table, but I'm not really going to do that. Um, I have a different view of coalitions. I think um, whomever shares your mission, vision, and goals is who you need to have at the table. And frankly, I think a lot of coalitions get bogged down because they're looking at those checklists. Okay, we have to have law enforcement, we have to have the schools, we have to have community leaders, faith leaders, we have to have youth, we have to have parents, and they get so focused on checking off those boxes and waiting for those people to come to the table that they're paralyzed, they don't do anything. So I'm saying it is important to invite those people and try to get them involved, but do not wait for that perfect coalition to form because it's not gonna happen. You're gonna be waiting forever. If you're waiting for everyone to come to the table before you take action, it's not gonna happen. So whomever at the moment wants to help you accomplish your goal is who you should have at your table. Um, it's better to have a handful of committed and energetic people or organizations at your table than 20 people who aren't. So um, this is true for task forces as well on a smaller scale. You know, you need to have committed people who are ready to go as opposed to waiting for people who may or may not show up to your coalition. So out of the many, many lists that in the guides that are out there for building coalition members, here are the ones that they, you know, everyone always recommends. And I'm sure, you know, you've been part of coalitions based on these um, sectors. Some more traditional, you know, I think none of us have any questions about that. But you know, have you ever thought about, okay, these are my traditional partners and stakeholders and collaborators, but who else might I invite? And here's just some over the years that uh, being part of other coalitions that um, we have reached out to. So maybe there are service organizations, you know, beyond fraternities and sororities, like all the animal clubs, lions, elks, um eagles you know all those rotary kiwanas all those service organizations what about landlord tenant associations if you're working on a campus you definitely have to have landlord tenant associations involved in your coalitions um, because that's where a lot of your students live coroners funeral homes you know who can who can share information about drunk driving or things like that um or that are non-traditional um, I have a coalition where our sheriff is heavily involved in, and he does a lot of things in his jail to promote uh, prevention and treatment. Um, and you can see the rest there. So, you know, especially if you work on a university campus, you have brilliant minds at your disposal, people who can do research for you, people who can help you with project evaluation. Um, use those students, use those department heads if, if you can get them involved. Okay, so I'm going to do the first poll here, um, and let me know if you see the quick poll box that has popped up. It says, what is an ideal membership for your coalition or task force? Do you all see that? Yes. Okay. If you could take that poll for me, please, I'll give you a minute or two to do that. Okay, you have about 40 more seconds. And everyone is choosing the right answer so far. Um, 
it is, you know, from as many sectors as possible as we talked about, but pretty much anyone who supports your goal and agenda. So you all passed that one. That is correct. And I'm going to close the poll now. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to share any experience about um, if you have reached out to kind of a non-traditional member to be part of your coalition or task force and who that was and why you chose them? Has anyone had that experience? We're all just going with traditional coalition members. Well, maybe after today, you will decide to uh, think outside the box and maybe choose someone else. Okay. I wanna talk a little bit about types of coalition members and I'm sure you all have had experience with probably most of these types, but um, we're gonna talk about these and I would like to hear from you about how your experience was. Either you are one of these, one of a, we're all fit into one of these categories and then the people that we work with also. So. Are people willing to be a part of your coalition? Or are they in it, you know, for the fact that they want to get something out of it for themselves? Which again isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as you know their agenda at the beginning. Um, if they have a hidden agenda, that will definitely cause issues. If you know their agenda at the beginning, then you can uh, figure out how to handle that. Um, so we're going to talk about light bulbs. These are your idea people. They always have new ideas about what can be done, how things could be different, who should do it, which is helpful. They have a lot of great ideas. Um, sometimes they're not feasible, but these are not, you know, the people who are going to dig in and do the work. They're just the idea people. And then you have the worker bees. Um, I'll give you an interesting fact about nature that all worker bees are female, if you didn't know that. 80% um and i think this is true in our coalitions 80 percent of the members do 20 percent of the work or more sometimes um but these worker bees are always willing to volunteer to do things outside of their you know role in the coalition um they're your people that you can always count on message multipliers are members who use their own influence and their own networks to deliver your coalition message or to help educate people. Um, they you know, might be influences, influencers in your community or on your campus, but they are willing to use their resources um, at a higher level to help the coalition. Challengers, it's just like it sounds. They always challenge decisions. They're always asking questions. They're always being the devil's advocate and sometimes these people are difficult to work with we know but they are important to the process um, because they help us think and they help us also figure out maybe what our opposition might be throwing our way because they can be oppositional and then sustainers are the people who really you know are working to make sure the coalition efforts are going to be around for a long time they work to find funding they bring in more strategic partnerships. They always are supportive of coalition leadership. You know, they're your cheerleaders and your, um, you know, your optimistic persons. So I don't know if this, I mean, this song dates me, but uh, I'll give you a bonus point if you can tell me which group sang this song, what the name of it is, and. Uh, which group sang it in approximate in what year, if you know? Anyone know? Boy, I must be the oldest person on this call. <laughs> okay, this is a song from 1984 called Forever Young by Alphaville. And I think the lyrics kind of are like coalition. Some are like water, some are like heat. Some are the melody, some are the beat. We're all different, but sooner or later, we're all going to, they're all the coalitions are going to be gone. Um, and why is that? And, um, you know, it's, it's hard for us to let our coalitions go sometimes because we feel like 
we're kind of letting the issue go or letting our cause go and you know we might have started it it's something that we've nurtured and cared for and it's really hard to let us go let it go but um, we need to really bring in the next generation of people so listen to the song forever young today by alphaville you'll enjoy it so why does it matter um why are life cycles of coalitions important like i said when i first started working in coalitions i i thought it i was a failure if the coalition wasn't functioning 100 percent all the time and you know never went through any changes well that's not realistic and um, we're going to talk about life stages of a coalition because they have just like everything there's a life cycle of a coalition too and when we understand that and are able to accept it and work through the stages it helps us kind of let go of things and realize that you know coalitions don't have to last forever and um that's okay so understanding the stages or life cycles of a coalition helps us set realistic goals and expectations if you know that you're only going to have the task force on your campus or the coalition for you know one academic year that is going to definitely change the goals you have for you know what you want to accomplish um because you're not going to have time to do everything um it also helps us get through growing pains every coalition has growing pains just like a kid when uh you know you're going through your first growth spurt you have a lot of growing pains and um understanding that those are going to come helps us deal with them when they do come helps us recruit the best leadership you know we don't have time to wait for three years for a coalition to come together and choose a leader you know we need to do that from the start and leaders will change and that's okay too um and then you know finally understanding the life change life cycles or stages lets us know when it's time to say okay it's time to let this one go we've done all we can do and it's time to move on so i want to go back to um to the various personalities or people that you'll find in your coalition and um i already talked about the light bulb people um they're so great because they have this way of visualizing things and seeing things that we might not always be able to envision they're optimistic about the future like i said what they propose might not always be realistic or attainable like maybe on IUPUI's campus they want all the vending machines to only have fresh vegetables and fruit well that's not realistic um it's not attainable a lot of students wouldn't want that they want chips and pepsi um, but it's great to have these people on board because um, they give us new ideas. Are any of you, do any of you consider yourselves to be light bulbs? Anybody? No? Okay. The worker bees always want to have a specific role in your coalition or task force. They might want to be the media spokesperson. They might want to write all the press releases. Maybe they want to be the person who coordinates your trainings and finds your, uh, you know, space to have training. Maybe they want to write your grants. And if you find that person, please send them my, my way. Um, they're definitely the cheerleader. They want to be involved, but they want to have a task. And if we don't give these worker bees a task or something to do something to make them feel useful they may go away they might leave your task force they might leave your coalition because they don't feel useful and that is really you know their purpose in life they in not only in their work but but in all aspects of their life is anybody on today a worker bee do you consider yourself a worker bee Well, okay, no worker bees on the call. Hopefully you have a lot of those in your coalitions. We talked about the message multipliers that are really skilled at using their own networks to share the coalition message. Um, they have access to maybe people we don't have, like funders or you know, community leaders that maybe we don't know. Um, you know, maybe they're 
a CEO of an organization and have influence over, you know, a lot of um, other organizations in the community. These are the people who bring high visibility to us and what we're doing. And, you know, it could be a celebrity, you know, maybe it's a local celebrity um, or, you know, maybe on your campus, it's a star athlete or someone like that in your community. It might be your mayor, um, but these are the people who can, can bring the attention that we need and we don't always get. Um, anybody here think you are good at uh, message multiplying? Well, maybe you're finding your role today as we're talking. Anybody have a, a message multiplier on your coalition that um, has done a lot of good for bringing high visibility to what you're doing? Anybody work with mayors or local celebrities or athletes? So we talked about challengers um, who often are, you know, on the other side of where we are. And maybe that's what they do just to get us to think. Maybe they really are always in opposition to what we're trying to do. Um, who knows? But it is difficult to have them at the table sometimes. Um, you know, we might not always like to deal with a challenger because it feels confrontational and you know, I don't know about you, but I don't really like conflict. Um, it feels uncomfortable. It feels like it might be working against the mission of the coalition. Um, you know, it's that coalition member that we kind of dread seeing walk through the door or, you know, we don't want them to say anything at the meeting because we know it's just gonna be, you know, might end up in a discussion or a heated argument or whatever. Um, but having their input is important because it helps us to see the other side of the argument. This has been helpful for me as a lobbyist because I know what the opposition is going to say because I've talked to them and they don't agree with me and they've told me their position and it helps me prepare my testimony. It helps me prepare my information that I give legislators because I know what they're gonna say. So um, it's not always easy having them at our table, but it's important. Does anyone have any experience with working with someone you would consider to be a challenger and how did you handle that? Wow, you guys must have great coalitions. Nobody's ever had to work with a challenger. I'm impressed. So sustainers are those people who can see the long view of what we're trying to do and accomplish. Um, these are the people who will, you know, for fun, look for grants. Oh, hey, you know, I was looking over the weekend, I found this grant, I think it's something we could really do. Um, you know, they're always supportive of leadership. They're, you know, eager to find the best leaders when it's time to transition. Um, they're cheerleaders, they want the work to continue, and they're willing to do what they can um, to help make that happen. So sustainers, of course, are um, really important to us um, because, you know, most of us don't love looking for grant opportunities or figuring out what another strategic partnership might look like, um, but these coalition members do, and that's their strength. There are also different types of coalitions. Um, you know what, Not one type is not more important than the other. They're all important, they all work. It could be an informal coalition that doesn't have really any budget or formalized structure, um, you know, but there is someone who kind of, you know, will take minutes and, you know, share things and people work together. It's just kind of informal. Then you have more formal ones um who are incorporated maybe these are corporate boards um you know a lot of times they have a staff and they have a strategic plan and they have funding then there's group networks and this is you know like a lot of our coalitions um 
we come together to share information. Maybe we work together on a project or two, but we're part of a larger coalition. Um, ICANN, for instance, is part of a statewide group network that um, we come together uh, at least once a year to share information and talk about you know, what we're doing in our state. And then there's semi-formal. Um, you might have a space, maybe you have a student who serves as your secretary or whatever, but it's a little less formal. And all of these are fine. One is not better than the other. But all of them have, when they're successful, have something in common. Strong leaders, diverse members, um, they understand the stages of a coalition, they understand the life cycles of a coalition, and they can address expectations and anticipate some potential conflicts down the road or potential challenges. So no matter what your coalition looks like, if it's successful, it probably has most of these elements. So there are some factors that influence the life cycle of a coalition. How long has it been around? Uh, the size of it, how big of it, who, how big it is, who is the leader? You know, what's the leadership look like? Is there just a chairperson? Is there paid staff? Um, is the coalition growing and effective or not? And then what are some other influence uh, factors that influence the work of the coalition? And these are important to ask no matter what stage, what life cycle stage your coalition is in. Um, it's always good to, you know, ask these questions. So these are the basic stages of a coalition. So you're building, starting, growing, maturing, declining, and dying. And we're going to talk about each of these uh, in a little more detail. Coalitions really are like trees. If you look at this life cycle of a tree, it starts with a seed, then becomes a sprout, then a sapling, then a mature tree, and then unfortunately becomes a dead tree and then a rotting log. Um, so it's great to be in, you know, you can be in any of these stages, um, but don't be a rotting log, which just lays there and does nothing. Uh, make sure that even if you come to the end of your coalition's life, that you're spreading the seeds of your work and that you're, you know, mentoring others to take over this work and that you're um, putting out new roots so that work can continue maybe even in a different way. Um, just don't be a rotting log that just lays there and, and never does anything again. So when we talk about building a coalition, basically that's an idea stage. Um, maybe there's an issue that you want to address on your campus or in your community and you have to ask yourself okay can we bring people together to work on this or not will people think it's important is it feasible to do it um you know you're going to run into challenges and opportunities at this stage this is kind of the pre-planning stage um if you're looking at the community readiness matrix um you know this is the time when it's really uh opportune for you to do media and community presentations. Um, and, and coalitions will form naturally around an idea or a shared interest or concern. So, um, you know, this is the stage to figure all that out. And you can see the challenges there. You might not have the community support you want. Maybe you don't think there's gonna be consensus on an issue. Um, there's no one to lead the coalition. Um, but there are also opportunities. When you're starting out, when it's just an idea, you can make it look like whatever you want it to look like. And at the beginning of a coalition, everyone has a lot of energy and passion. No one's burned out. No one's tired of going to 6,000 meetings. Um, everyone is excited and hoping for change and ready to be there. So the building, the building stage of a coalition um, is exciting. We are all optimistic at that stage. So the next uh, phase is starting a coalition. So maybe you decided, yep, it's a great idea. We're starting a coalition. Um, this is, would be the pre-planning and initiation uh, stage of community readiness. So you ask yourself, you know, 
who could possibly lead us? Um, how do we even get things started? Do we want to incorporate as a nonprofit? Can we be part of another organization? Are we going to be informal, formal? You know, we need to figure out our structure. Um, you know, the challenges could be that people might not want to form a coalition around an issue. Maybe that feels too, um, too, maybe they feel too exposed by doing that. Um, enthusiasm and excitement is great when you're pre-planning and starting, but then when the real work comes, maybe people aren't so energetic anymore. Um, and then we've all had this experience of writing the mission, vision, values, which frankly, I think isn't, you know, is important as a as a guide, but not the most important thing. And we can spend a lot of time, a lot of wasted energy trying to form these mission, vision, values, because it's not always easy to get consensus. And people like to be wordsmiths, and it can take up a lot of time. Um, funders are excited to learn, maybe, that you have a new coalition focusing on, maybe it's obesity or heart disease or whatever it is. Um, this is when the natural leaders emerge. Maybe that's you. Um, people are excited to be part of an experience where they get to shape something from the ground up. Maybe they've never had that experience and then no one is tired or disillusioned yet. Any questions so far? And this is where you might, you know, sign your formalized agreements, maybe you have letters of agreement with people or, um, you know, pledges or whatever. This is where you might have a kickoff. Um, you might start developing your action plan. And then we move to the growing stage of a coalition. This is where your coalition is thriving. You know, you've got everyone at the table you want at the table. You have the leader that you want. You know, you are uh, getting a lot of, um, you know, uh, attention in your community. Um, there are some challenges though. People might start to feel overwhelmed as the coalition grows. Maybe they don't want new members at the table. Maybe they wanna get rid of some of the members that are there. Um, you know, maybe they don't like the direction you're going. They don't wanna work on policy. They only wanna do programs, whatever it might be. Um, this is when you also see that you know, differences of opinion start coming out. You might find that challenger person at your table and it will start to impact your decision making. Um, you know, frankly, oftentimes if there's no money to share with anyone, that's easy. But if you have a, a certain pot of money and you can only share it with, you know, one or two organizations, or I find this true, you know, in our uh, drug-free Boone County LCC, um, you know, sometimes if people don't get funding, they decide they're not going to sit at the table anymore. And that is certainly their choice, but that does impact who sticks around. Um, and then, like I said, the direction you go may impact who stays involved. When I was first forming the uh, Indiana Coalition to Reduce Underage Drinking, we were moving away from programming. That wasn't our purpose. Our purpose was advocacy. And there were people who really didn't want to do that, and they only wanted to do program. And so they left and that's okay, because it wasn't for them. Um, but the opportunities are that people feel ownership of the accomplishments, which is good. And they need to, because they've helped, you know, form this coalition. Um, things, you know, we already talked about how bringing different opinions to the table can lead to more effective approaches or more creative approaches. And we all need that. And then, you know, people's strengths really start to emerge. Maybe you have someone who's great at being a spokesperson and you hate it. Well, great, they can do it for you. And that um, will emerge from this stage. And this is when you really need to um, formalize your structure, whatever you decide that's gonna look like. Um, make sure everyone is, you know, understanding what the mission is, what your goal is, um, you know, start ident start developing and promoting yourselves as the expert in your community or on your campus. You know, you want to be the person that someone calls when they have a question about high risk drinking or prevention in the community or how do we, you know, implement this program. And 
as with every stage, I think it's important to celebrate your accomplishments, no matter how big or small you think they are, or milestones. Frankly, you know, we've been around for a year. That's an accomplishment. Let's celebrate that. And then we have the maturing stage. Um, the coalition is established. People recognize your name. They recognize you as an expert. Um, you know, you're kind of like that mature oak tree. Um, people can know they can rely on you. They know that the information you give them is going to be factual. Um, they know that coalition members are dependable. They'll call you to come and give programs or speak. You might do something every year. Um, you know, because people know that you're going to deliver quality content. Um, and this is where you start asking, you know, we, we've done all these great things. Are we going to continue? Are we still needed? It's time to start asking those kind of tougher questions. Um, the challenges at this stage are that, you know, you might have had the same leader for 15 years and maybe you know, they don't want to do it anymore. They aren't willing to change. Um, you know, maybe they've just lost their energy. Um, if you have new members, the people who've been around for 15 years might, you know, not appreciate that new members have come in and, you know, kind of upset the apple cart with new ideas and, you know, challenges. Um, this is where people start to drop out. You know, members and org organizations start to drop out because you know, they've moved on to other issues. Um, you know, they don't work at the organization anymore and no one wants to take their place or whatever it might be. Maybe you lose your funding or are starting to lose your funding at this stage if you ever had any, uh, or maybe you can't, you know, sustain the funding that you have. And then people tend to not be fully engaged at this point because everyone's kind of on autopilot because, you know, you've been doing great things for 15 years and you know, everyone's kind of on autopilot now. Um, but there are opportunities as well. Um, you know, like I said, you're the ones that are gonna be seen as the expert. Um, maybe you have found funding. Someone has said, you know what, we're gonna fund you for as long as you're around. And then, um, you know, you do have new members who might be open to new approaches and ideas. Things you might do at this stage are, you know, have member interviews. Do you still want to be involved? Do you feel like, you know, your voice is being heard? Do you feel useful? Just do a, a member um, poll or survey. Um, you know, this is when we need to look at our sustainability and highlight what we're doing. Maybe you put out an annual report. Maybe you have an annual meeting, um, whatever it might be. Anybody have any questions? or comments about this stage. And then we move to the declining. The coalition is declining. Um, you know, you maybe you had a leadership crisis. Your, your leader has left and there's really no one who wants to take over. Um, I'm in a service sorority and this happened to us a couple years ago. I had just completed my four year term as president. No one wanted to step up. And it was up to me to find a replacement and no one wanted to do it. And I was finally able to coax my friend, her name also is Lisa, into the role, but she was hesitant and she had a lot of questions and I really had to kind of hold her hand through that process. But in the end, you know, she did it and she was glad she did it. She was a great president. But, um, you know, this is where leaders drop out. You know, no one has any energy anymore. No one's enthusiastic about the cause. And I think sometimes with underage drinking in particular, this can be the case because, you know, even though it's our most widely used drug, alcohol is by teen and adults in our state, other issues take priority. You know, it might be opioids, which, you know, we did have a crisis. It should have gotten attention. Um, maybe it's um, heroin, but no one cares about an alcohol anymore. No one has any energy to address it um, or whatever your issue might be. So we're not effective anymore. You know, we we don't do anything anymore. No one calls on us anymore to do programs. No one calls us for media interviews. Um, so, you know, is, is our coalition coming to an end? And like I've said, it's okay. If your coalition is declining, it is okay to say, you know what? 
this may be the end of the road for this coalition. That is fine. Um, there are opportunities at this stage too, though. It's your chance to reinvent your coalition. Um, maybe, you know, you take a different view of an issue you've been working on, or maybe you say, okay, we're done with this issue. We're moving on to this one. Who wants to stay engaged? This is how you can re-energize your members. Um, you know, the people that have, have stuck around in your coalitions for so long have all the institutional knowledge and expertise. You need to figure out how to use them. You know, once the coalition ends, can they be part of a speakers bureau? Can, you know, you do um, uh, editorial boards, you know, with those people? Can you, whatever, radio? Um, how, do you use, how do you use your members who have stuck with you all this time? And then it's a change to uh, look at your direction. Maybe, maybe you want to go in a completely different way and have a you know whole new coalition focusing on something completely different, and that's okay. But you need to ask yourself the hard questions. Um, this is where you decide whether or not you're going to disband, or maybe you're going to merge with another organization or another coalition in your community or on your campus. Um, obviously, if you decide to disband, especially if you're a more formal structure, you have to inform everyone that it's happening. Um, I've seen two examples of this in the last year. I don't know if it was necessarily because of COVID, but um, organizations, youth serving organizations have decided to merge with others because they just don't have the resources to function on their own anymore. Um, you know, so celebrate that though. You know, it's stronger together. We're merging with XYZ organization and we're excited and we're gonna be stronger, you know, than ever since we have more partners. Um, and if you decide that you are going to renew or go in a different direction, um, it's the time to do recommitment. Do you want to be involved or not? Is it, is it time, you know, for, for the person to leave your coalition and, um, that's okay. Maybe they are tired of meetings and, you know, they don't want to go to meetings anymore. That's okay. And then the final stage although it's not really the final stage, but the shutting down dying stage. Um, you know, how do you shut down with the least negative impact? You've done so much good work, you know, that's always gonna linger. Everyone's gonna, you know, remember the work you've done, but, you know, disbanding a coalition can have, um, you know, some negative effects if it's not handled correctly. Everyone's gonna be sad about shutting down. Some members may not want you to do it, no, we need this coalition. We don't want you to, you know, disband the coalition. We can still make changes. So some people are going to be sad and not accept it. Um, you know, we might be afraid of shutting down. Well, who's going to do the prevention work now in our community? You know, we were the ones doing everything. Now who's going to do it? Um, people might feel defensive. Well, you must not think I'm a good leader or a good coalition member if you're shutting the coalition down. You know, maybe the community uh, thinks something horrible has happened and, you know, gives you negative feedback because you're shutting down. Um, maybe your community feels abandoned. You know, who's going to do our, you know, drug-free events with our kids in the summer? And there are even opportunities at this stage. Even though, you know, you know you're shutting it down, um, you can help your stakeholders and coalition members find other ways to be involved. Maybe it's still with you in some capacity, but maybe it's with within another department on your campus or another agency in your in your uh, community. Um, you know, leave on a high, leave on a positive note, have a big celebration, list all the accomplishments that, you know, you've done over the past however many years you've been working. Um, celebrate everything that, um, you know, you've had a hand in and leave on a positive note. And then, like I said, you know, even if, you know you're shutting it down, you've planted seeds, you've hopefully trained, you know, the next generation to carry on the prevention work. I've seen this in my own personal work. Um, there are at least two young, they're women now, um, that I knew when they were youth and they were part of the state's youth leadership group when that existed. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough that they, you saw me as a mentor, and now both of those women are working in um, prevention in some way and have furthered the field, and that makes me really proud. 
So even though, you know, you might say this is the end of the line for this coalition or task force, hopefully you have brought the next generation up or passed the torch to someone else. And these are just some things that you know you you should do during this stage. Um, obviously, if you are funded, you know, by a state source of funding or a federal, you have to make sure you have all your financial records and they're all stored to all the accounting rules and all of that. Um, like I said, celebrate, you know, with your members and your volunteers. Um, there are a lot of logistics that you might have to take care of. Um, it's your chance to control the message. Don't just disband and leave the community wondering, where did they go? Why did they disband? Was there a scandal? This allows you to control the message. Send out a press release. We're merging. You know, we have uh, reached our goals. So we feel like it's, you know, we don't, uh, this coalition has accomplished their goals. We don't need to exist anymore. Um, so you control the message. And then of course you have to take time to process it because especially if you're the one that started it, and you've been working at it for so many years, um, it is hard to process that it's not, you know, gonna happen anymore. Um, you know, make sure your members applaud the past, but also see a future and, you know, can figure out a way to be involved somewhere else. But just like this tree that was chopped down and obviously, thought to be dead, you can see, you know, there's new growth out of it. So new growth can come. Um, it's not always apparent to us at first, but new growth can come. So I'm gonna launch the second poll now, and I want you to be honest and think about the coalitions that you're involved in or the coalitions that you may have started. And where are you? At what stage are you in your coalition? in the life of your coalition right now. And, you know, we really um, shouldn't be afraid no matter what stage we're in because we'll obviously move on to the next one. And even if we're in the declining dying stage, we're still evaluating what's next and it's okay, you know, that we are accepting of that and, and moving on. So it looks like it's pretty evenly split right now um, with people thinking about a coalition starting one or that they're in the declining dying stage. So that's really interesting. Give you a minute or two more to answer. Some of you are in the growing stage. Your coalition is doing great things, which we like. We have about 50% of you voted. We'll allow the other 50% of you to give us your thoughts, and then I'll close the poll. And it looks like most of you, okay, now we have someone who are nurturing. So actually everyone on the call is at, at least one stage of, of the life cycle. So that's good. We're all at different stages in what we're doing. I'm gonna close the poll in about 20 seconds. Okay, so it's good to see that um, all of you can kind of recognize which stage you're in and it looks like we're all in different stages. So that's, that's good, we have a lot of diversity on today. So how do we build a smart coalition? Um, and you know, what do I mean by smart coalition? Um, you know, coalitions that are going to work the best that they can. And you know, depend, no matter what stage you're at, even if you're at the declining dying stage, you could still have a smart coalition. 
Um, the first and most important thing, I think, no matter what, if it's a coalition, an organization, a business, a school district, you have to have leaders who aren't afraid to serve and who will roll up their sleeves and, you know, literally sometimes roll up their sleeves and do work. Um, if you have a leader who just dictates what everyone else should do and they're not willing to to actually, you know, come out on a Saturday and be part of your activities or, you know, work at night when you have, a, you know, training for families, then they may not be the best leader. You have to have leaders who are servant leaders. Um, of course, you need a clear vision and you have to trust your leaders to make decisions and that can you know bring a lot of conflict if members don't trust leaders um relationships are key i don't care what you're doing this is key even with those people who we would consider to be challengers um relationships are key i say this about everything legislator legislature relationships are key um you know recognizing and being able to use your member strengths making sure you're not you know wasting the time of your members not meeting just to meet making sure you're giving those worker bees something to do um so they don't you know feel unuseful and leave um and then celebrating celebrating is always important at every stage don't let things die by committee and i uh, saw this quote that said a camel is a horse designed by a committee meaning that sometimes committees have a lot of opinions they might be you know in conflict with each other and they don't make sense and then you try to put them all together and try to do it and instead of realizing the absurdity of what you've put together um you try to accomplish it and it doesn't happen and it's you know it could be the wrong program at the wrong time it could be you know whatever it is but do not let things die by committee which often happens when there's you know a lot of people involved and there's no clear direction so i like to compare coalitions to um, beehives coalitions really are beehives you know it's a tight and protective structure um, it's well recognized everyone knows what a beehive looks like and if you've been doing work long enough in your community as a coalition people recognize you um, every B has a specific role, just like in your coalition, every coalition member should have a specific role as they fall into those categories that we've talked about. The light bulb people, the cheerleaders, um, the worker bees. Um, and it might seem small that you have someone who always brings coffee and donuts to your meetings, or maybe they always make sure the room is set up. And that might seem like a small thing, but when we all do the things that we are our best at um it really does create something wonderful and useful just like all the bees working to, together to create honey so does anyone have any questions about what you've heard before we take our third poll or do you have any comments okay our third poll is um what are some ways to build a smart coalition? I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer the question. So far, no one is chewing, choosing, telling, telling everyone what to do and how to do it, which is good. Give you about 30 more seconds.
Well, you all got the questions correct. Actually, all of these, except for telling everyone what to do and how to do it is the correct answer. So thank you for answering that. Um, I We have a few more minutes left, so I would like to hear from either Amanda or Casey, um, Kathy, any of you who have been doing coalition work for a long time, um, is there anything you wanna share about, you know, have you been involved in coalitions at the various life cycles and stages of a coalition? Have you dealt with, you know, or worked with, um, you know, some of the coalition members that we've talked about, the different personalities? Um, do you have any experiences that would be beneficial for everyone to hear. Has anyone been part of a, like a dying coalition? You knew you were gonna shut it down. Um, and how did that process go? Oh, I'll go ahead and talk. Um, this is Gabby. So yeah, I kind of I've been through every cycle of a coalition. <laughs> the one that I had that the one I was on that died was because of funding, um, which was the main reason it existed. But um, yeah, it's it's really even if you find the different personality types, it's finding a way to leverage those. Mm -hmm. It's not like the person who's challenger is always going to be combative. There's a reason that they're coming at it from that angle, which I often find is refreshing especially yep. if you're in a room full of like-minded people. Yep. Um, it gives you that other perspective, which is kind of nice. Yeah, that's good. Um, it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to remember that, but yeah, maybe they aren't doing it just to be confrontational all the time. They really do see it. Some people have a, a knack for seeing things a different way than we do, and that really is their strength. And we do have to figure out how to leverage it, like you said. Thank you. Anyone else want to share your coalition experience, either building one or being in one? I can I can share a little bit, Lisa. This is Casey. Hi, Casey. Hey. Um. So we've kind of had like a revamping of our coalition recently, and um, I was really glad you mentioned the you know focus on the mission and um, uh, part of that because I think that's been important for us. It's just kind of refocusing on hey why are we why were we here in the first place kind of stuff and that's kind of uh, led to some new conversations some things that maybe we should have already been doing anyways it's kind of re-energized everyone i think a little bit um, so i great. thought that was a, a good example that you gave yeah that's great that's what we like to to hope will happen when you know there's um a change of any kind that it kind of redirects us and re-energizes us um, you know and maybe we don't have to address the problem that we were addressing five years ago you know maybe um, we've made a lot of progress on that issue and we can move on to something else or maybe we address it in a different way so that's good to hear anybody else have an experience you want to share I would just like to echo what everyone else was saying um when i was in idaho um i had the opportunity to you know be a co-chair of our um very similar to you lisa actually pretty identical to you uh lisa in your role um with the state and coordinating and, and getting all us together so thank you so much for for doing that i can understand how challenging that is especially working with um higher ed professionals in at other institutions um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So and that and that have as I actually had the opportunity due to uh SPIF funding, SPIF SIG funding through our state. Um so going through that and looking at the the needs of the community through our logic models and seeing how previously the coalition um we had to change our, our vision and goals and our objectives because um the former leadership met those, you know, and, and it was time for to me to come in and do something different. And unfortunately, um, I actually talking to my colleagues um, in Idaho and keeping up and keeping in touch with them. Um, the, the coalition is currently in a dying phase since uh, I left 
um, which is like like you said, a good thing. And I was and I was trying to encourage them to, you know, not create the recreate the wheel or you know the things that I've done, but looking to explore what are some of the opportunities you know that I missed that we could still work on and and to to encourage them to change you know you know their vision um, for the next you know five or six years. Um, in my absence. So a lot of the time I would just say, uh, I agree with everyone else, but it's also having past leadership um, encourage and recognize that these are st stages um, of, you know, the coalition and to um, support support them um, in, in the new role or support the new leadership. Yeah, definitely. I think that's so important. Like I said, a lot of us when we're involved in coalitions, we don't want it to die. We don't want it to change. We want it to be in that nurturing stage where everything is going great and you know we're accomplishing a lot. But um, but you know, like I've said today, it's okay if it changes. It's okay if it dies and a new one emerges or not even. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing that, Lauren. Um, that was Lauren, by the way. <laughs> in case you guys could figure out who was talking. Does anyone else have Sorry. anything? That's okay. I, Lauren from uh, Idaho, uh, I will say Idaho. See, I was talking about my experience in Idaho. <laughs> Indiana State University, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We knew you weren't in Idaho anymore. Um, anyone else have any experiences you would like to share about, you know, or maybe even what personality you are and where you fit within a coalition? Um, I like to think I'm a worker bee. I think that's where I fit in to most everything in my life. I'm a worker bee. Um, so I identify a lot with the the honeybees in this picture, but that's me. Anyone else have a clear definition of what kind of a coalition member you are? And you know, maybe you look at your coalition members through the lens that you've received today about the different types and you know, that'll help you identify people and you know, maybe that'll help you or even ask them, where do you fall into these, um, you know, various um, roles and maybe that will help you figure out how to utilize their strengths more um, and to, you know, utilize them in the decision-making process. So I think it's a good reminder for all of us as we continue the work of our coalitions, or our task forces, or we're just thinking about building them. And by the way, if you are at the stage where you're thinking about building or building your coalition, you know, please reach out um, to me. We have a lot of expertise on this call as well, but you know, we offer technical assistance to help you do that at no cost. So please reach out if you feel like you want some direction there. And then um, this is how you can reach me. Um, I'm, you know, working from home at the moment, but that really doesn't mean anything. It just means I spend less money on gas. So um, reach out to me if you have any questions about today. This will be uh, posted on our website. Usually takes about a week for us to get things up. Um, I will say to you that we are in the process of revamping our ICANN and iCred websites. They're going to be much more interactive, much more dynamic. I'm very excited. Hopefully that will uh, that process will be completed in August as you're returning to campus, as your schools are going back in your community. So look for more information about that. I also wanted to let you know that the um, ICSES, the Indiana College Substance Use Survey uh, results are in. We aren't releasing them yet um, because the formalized report hasn't been written, but um, you will soon hear about the results from that. So I'm very eager to see what the past year was like for all of us in terms of substance use and mental health on our campuses in particularly. Um, so you'll be getting more information about that. And if you participated in that survey, you should be getting your data if you already haven't. Um, you can do whatever you want with your data. Um, you know, use it for programming and policy making. You can do press release, whatever you want, but um, we will not be releasing the statewide data quite yet. Um, does anyone else have anything you want to share for the good of the group? Any trainings or anything coming up? Any opportunities that you know of? We will be releasing our uh, 
mini grant application in August. Also the uh, registration for our November conference should be open in September. Um, like I said, we're excited to have that in person. We will be able to offer some travel scholarships. Those will be first come first serve. So you'll get that information as well because we know a lot of you have no budgets to go anywhere or do anything. So we wanna help you with that if we can. It'll be a full agenda. I think a lot of interesting information we're gonna talk about marijuana and all the products that are legal here in Indiana and not legal. Um, we're gonna hear from legislators. We're gonna hear from our mini grant people. We're gonna uh, talk about mental health and self care. I think it's gonna be a good conference. So look for that information coming soon. Anyone else have anything, Kathy, anything happening on the state level we should know about? Not yet. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware that DMHA has gotten a decent amount of stimulus funds. We're still planning what that's going to look like. Um, ideally, I would love to plan to fund some more colleges and expand what Lisa's doing, um, but we still have to finalize some of those. And those funds aren't set to start until the federal fiscal year, so like the end of September, beginning of October. So we still have some time on that. But keep you guys aware, as you know, I send Lisa a lot of things that she'll send to you guys, but just keep your, your emails um, open and receptive because there will definitely be some funding opportunities coming your guys' way. Okay, we are excited about that funding coming. We don't know what it's going to look like, but we will support coalitions and campuses as much as we can. So be looking for that. Um, so the last three polls are just your NOMS data that I have to collect. Um, so please answer these questions and then um, we will be done for the day. So I'll open this one first give you a couple minutes to answer that and then the other two let me give you few more seconds to answer. Okay. All right, and the next one. I couldn't figure out a better way to do this, so I apologize that it came in three. And then the third one is the dreaded age question. Couple more seconds to answer this one. We y'all are young. Okay, has everyone answered? Okay. Well, I really appreciate your um, attending today and giving us some good feedback. And um, I know it's the end of June and we're all ready to just enjoy the summer a little bit. So thank you for joining us today. And um, we will be sending out a lot of information in the next several months. So watch your email. But um, another thing we'll be sending out is uh, a poll to gauge your interest in various training topics. We always 
create these trainings based on feedback from you because we want to make sure it's useful for you. So um, we would appreciate your input on those. So hope you all have a great rest of your week and stay cool. I know I think by uh, 4th of July, it's supposed to be much more pleasant outside. So I hope you all have a great rest of the week and we will be in touch with you soon. Thanks, everybody.